Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Boozer with CGC HQ, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's Connect webinar with Goliath Technologies. Um, we're going to talk about how you can resolve some of those common Citrix issues in just a matter of minutes, and you can stop people from uh, hopefully complaining about Citrix being slow or Citrix being a problem. Um, so we're going to show you that uh, today. But before we jump in, I have just a couple of announcements. Uh, next week is mm -hmm. our CGC XL in New York City. Uh, we hope you can make it out if you're in the area or if you just would like to come from anywhere, you're absolutely welcome to come. It's a full day event, um, lots of great content, even have uh, Calvin Sue from Citrix coming to give us a big update on what's going on. Um, so hopefully you can make it to that. Uh, and then if you are in India, in Bengaluru, there is another Excel, our first one ever in India. That is at the end of the month. And it's also another um, amazing full day of, of really great content with some Citrix experts where you're going to learn just a ton of stuff. So check those out in just a minute. I'll put a link in the chat to our events calendar where you can find all those details. All right, we are recording today's session. You will get a link to that recording in an email. Uh, it should come to you tomorrow, um, so be on the lookout for that. Also, we'd love to have you put your questions and your comments in at any time. We've got a Q&A panel specifically for your questions, so use that. And then just say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from, um, and you can you know, share your comments with each other there too. Um, but we'd like to get your questions in the Q&A panel if possible, so it's easier for us to keep track of those and they don't get lost in the chatter. All right, um, welcoming to our webinar stage today, Eric Haverstein. Uh, he is a CTP, he's going to be helping out Kiri Pence from Goliath Technologies. Hello, Eric and Kiri. Hi there, thank you. Thanks and for having us. Oh, you're welcome. Good to have you here today. Uh, we also have with us Steve Noel. He is a CTA. He's going to help us with the Q&A discussion. He's going to be weeding through the chat and looking at your questions in the question panel and, and helping to get those answered for you today. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. Thanks. All right, Kiri and Eric, I'm going to hand things directly over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you are free to take over and maybe say a little bit more about yourselves and get us going. Sure. Uh, after introductions, I'm going to go off camera just so that uh, you have a better, better view of the screen once we go into the demo. Uh, my name is Kiri Pence. I'm with Goliath. And uh, prior to Goliath, so I've been a Goliath about... Mm, seven, eight months now. Prior to that, I spent the uh, eight years prior at Citrix. So I actually come from Citrix. Uh, two years prior to that, I was at VMware. So I've, I've been in the EUC space for, for quite some time. Uh, and I'm pleased to have Eric with us as well, who is a CTP. Uh, Eric, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Gary. Yeah, my name is Eric. I'm originally from Norway. I've been working uh, with Citrix Technologies and work from home for the last 24 years. And now for the last five years, I've been living here in Brazil. So yeah, that's Brazil. me. All right. Let me just get my slides to populate here. There we go. And we should be good, yeah? Stephanie or, or yep. Eric, you were able to confirm my slides are perfect. Yep, looks good. Awesome. All right, so as Stephanie said, you know, our, our purpose here is to help you all figure out how to resolve some of your Citrix issues much more quickly. And, and actually, it's not as much about resolving them. Usually, the, the, the fix is fairly quick. It's, it's more about finding them. So we'll, we'll start off with just kind of talking about the, the objective, but then we want to look a little bit at the economic impact of ticket resolution. And there's a, there's a very distinct impact on the corporate bottom line. And if it's not something that, you know, you and your roles uh, <clears throat> as Citrix admins are thinking about, it is something uh, that your management is thinking about. So finding better ways to have uh, a more efficient ticket flow. And, and then really, you know, for the most common Citrix users, uh, user complaints, 
having a way to quickly identify those issues, get to root cause so that you can fix them more quickly uh, and preferably earlier in the escalation path and in the ticket flow process, you know, before everything automatically has to get escalated to, you know, Citrix admin simply because it had, you know, Citrix in the, in the ticket complaint. Uh, <clears throat> then we're going to go into a live demo. Uh, so you'll see what the, what the technology looks like in real time. And then we'll go ahead and wrap up and, and finish off with some Q&A. And as Stephanie said, if you don't mind putting your questions into the question panel, uh, it makes it easier to manage the questions and separate that from the, from the chat. So just kind of getting started here, uh, like I said, you know, the fix oftentimes for, for your Citrix issues uh, is usually pretty easy. It's the finding the issue that is the problem. Um, and in fact, we're seeing, you know, much of the time, you know, up to 90% of the time uh, of, of that mean time to resolution is really spent just trying to locate what the issue is. And, you know, that's a, that's a massive productivity killer. And, and Eric, you and I were, were talking a little bit about this and just that the amount of time spent, uh, you know, trying to find the issues is, is really where it, where it eats up uh, the Citrix admins times, because again, everything is getting escalated to that Citrix team because it's it's a Citrix issue in the ticket. But you know, these are these are easy to fix but hard to find issues. And that's why it really becomes more important to have uh, an efficient process, and this is where we talk about you know the the economic impact. Um, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about just um, you know, sort of the cost and the impact of, of tickets getting escalated to different points along the escalation path. Sure. We, we were discussing this the other day, and I actually think, that, you know, these numbers are pretty low compared to what I'm seeing in the real world. And, you know, what we're seeing over and over in time, especially for level one, it's very basic. It's, it's very hard to get people these days, especially on level two and level three, so level one being an entry point, you know, they do the basic stuff, check, check the version, you know, keep you updated and all that kind of stuff. But after that, if, if they can't resolve it, they, uh, they even go and uninstall the client and reinstall it just to make sure, you know, that they tried everything they could. And then it's got go to level two, level three. And the people are level two, level three, it's already packed with stuff and projects and all that kind of stuff. So it could really take a long time for us to actually jump in and, and pick a ticket, let's say two days, three days. And, and also you even have the, the, the smaller clients, the SMBs or well, SMB in, in US, it's not the same as SMB in Europe, of course, an SMB in Europe would be like 500 people. And there you normally have one or two admins who take care of everything. And, and we all know there is more and more stuff coming in. We have all the zero days, you know, vulnerabilities and all the kind of stuff. So there's so much work for, for the regular day-to-day -day admin to take care of. So, yeah. And you, and you brought up a good point too about how long it takes oftentimes for the, for the Citrix admins to actually pick the ticket up. You know, it could be a couple of days, even though it was escalated, it could be a couple of days before that ticket even gets picked up simply because of the of the existing workload. So the, you know, it's one thing to be able to resolve the issues quickly, you know, get to the root cause quickly from a Citrix admin perspective. But if you think uh, further upline, you know, towards the front side of the of the support process, you know, having tools and and visibility earlier in that process for you know level one or level two to be able to remediate issues without it always having to make it to level three that becomes important as well and, and you're right Eric when you when you talk about the numbers you know we're only we're only looking at this really from the cost of the of the individuals who are um, resolving the issues it doesn't account at all for any downtime so there's there's organizational dime time. If it's taken two to three days, you know, for a ticket to be picked up by the by the admin, you know, that user isn't working. They're not productive, or, or or their productivity is limited at best case. So there's a lot more that goes into the cost of an inefficient ticket flow. And and so we've kind of built out an example here. This is you know a fairly large organization. If you look at you know 500 tickets coming in weekly, it's about 26,000 annually. You know, you can see that the support costs 
could be much lower if, if you were able to resolve tickets either A, more efficiently, or B, earlier in the, in the ticket flow process. You know, Eric, you were talking about the level one guys and, um, you know, them, you know, not <clears throat> lacking a lot of the expertise to be able to do any real troubleshooting. And, and what we're seeing, and, and Eric, you can confirm this, what we're seeing a lot is um, that there's just a lot of churn at level one. So it's it's not even that the, the capacity to understand how to troubleshoot isn't there. It's that it's that individuals aren't there long enough to learn. And are you seeing similar things? Exactly. And, and it's not about that. It's also about the, the, uh, the tools that you have at hand. So, you know, monitoring is, a, is an essential tool in the toolbox to be able to have. But now that more and more people are starting to work from home, you know, if, if the, the, the client itself breaks or, or the city client doesn't work, it only works for web or the web start, you know, failing, then the level one guys needs to have, you know, a proper remoting tool to be able to connect to the user's home PC to be able to, you know, to, to, to do remediation there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but, you know, with, with the right tools, uh, at place at monitoring, it's much, much easier to, to get handle of, of this kind of stuff. Eric, what are you, what are you seeing by way of, uh, a shift from, IT specialists to more generalists. Are you seeing that as well? So you're seeing, you know, you know, maybe the level two, level three escalation points uh, oftentimes are, you know, staffed with people who are more generalist now uh, and less of the actual specialist experts in in house. Is that something you see as well? Yeah. So at the at the current full time customer we have now, we have eight thousand users being two and a half K on six, and we have 15 sites spread across the whole world. So we normally have, you know, the regular L1 support is both for secrets and regular app support, uh, SSCM engine. Uh, so they try at, at their best knowledge to solve this. And if it doesn't get solved, it, they, they're just gonna send it straight over to L2 at HQ which means that whatever case that the local IT cannot fix, they send it straight to the Citrix team at HQ. And, and do you feel like the Citrix team, um, do you feel like there's a, there are enough individuals, enough headcount on the Citrix team, or do you feel like there are just not enough experts out there? Not that the team itself lacks expertise, but that there are, not enough people out there to hire for open open roles. So that the Citrix team is uh, oftentimes overburdened simply because there aren't enough experts to help fill in some of those headcount. Do you see that as well? Exactly. So that's our current position. Uh, our we are, we actually have a job listing now for another guy. So there used to be two guys on the Citrix team. One left, so we have one, and we are unable to find the second one. So you know, it's it's really hard to find people now with the right skills. Well, there you have it. If you're on the call and you're looking for uh, a new position as a Citrix expert, uh, you can reach out to Eric. He's got an opening. There's a, a public service announcement for everyone. Yeah, that will be in Houston, Texas, two days a week, I think. In the <laughs> so when we think about a, a typical um, ticket flow, you know, there's there's all the steps, and 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 Eric, you kind of were talking about that earlier, but there's the loss of productivity that goes along with it. So that you know, the ticket comes in, it's signed to level one, and and, and by the way, not all support teams are are created the same. So there's a wide variation in organizational structure and scope at the various levels. So for a lot of organizations, level one is simply just triage. All they do is capture the tickets coming in and just route them. For some, they can go as far as, you know, password resets because the number one thing uh, as far as just tickets coming in to support our, you know, password resets, users lock themselves out. But beyond that, 
uh, a lot of times they they lack the expert expertise or the information. Eric, to your point, they don't have the tools in place to be able to do anything with it. So they they then have to escalate those, and those tickets then get routed. Well, again, if if you don't have the right information all the way through the escalation path, not just at the Citrix uh, admin level, but all the way through the escalation path, if they don't have the right information. Those tickets oftentimes don't get routed correctly. So, er Eric. Just curious from, you know, over your years of, of experience, how often do you, you know, have you seen tickets routed to the Citrix team that maybe should have been routed somewhere else or vice versa? You know, there were tickets that oh, were stuck that in, in the... That, that, happens, that happens a lot of times, especially in, in bigger organization where you have, you know, you have the security team, you have the... Uh, Digital workspace team, which is responsible for everything Office, everything Edge, and IIE compatibility mode and whatever. So there are so many different departments that you know the, the tickets just jumping from from one one team to the other one. Oh, sorry, you sent the ticket to the wrong team, and then it goes to the next one. In my opinion, basic stuff as as we covered here in the beginning should be solved at L, at the L1 stage, not at L2, because most of the cases are related connection issues and you know they don't getting their applications and whatever you know and and the people as we we're talking you know the people on, on especially on level three they are busy 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 patching you know 25 master images across the world with the latest and greatest of software updates and vulnerabilities so you know that's the problem today there are so many you know, zero days and attacks and all the kind of stuff that, you know, has a higher priority than, you know, one guy unable to connect out of two and a half thousand. And, and I imagine that maybe part of the problem too, when the, when that ticket's being passed around from, you know, team to team, you know, networking team, storage team, security team, whatever, they have their own monitoring tools, but it, but it's a myopic view, right? They can only see what's in their swim lane. And they can't see how anything impacts uh, other parts of the IT elements that impact that end user. So they don't even have the information to really be able to share back and forth. They just can see, well, my little bucket looks good. So the problem must be your problem. And then they pass it on. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's correct. So the sites only see their tickets un until they show up. And, you know, unless... It takes a couple of days, then the ticket will, will, you know, the priority will go from low to medium. But unless there is a manager from that side reaching out to the manager of the Citrix team, you know, it's just gonna go the normal flow of the ticket queue. So as you yeah. said, you have you have users unable to work simply because they tried login from India and SAP is not working. So they are contracted SAP consultants working from India, which means they're getting paid, but uh, they have no work doing. So it's expensive. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. And it will actually go into a, a, a use case when we go into the demo uh, that, would, uh, that would address that. Um, you know, and, and like you were saying that it, unless something is escalated, um, you know, from a management perspective, it just, it stays in that loop. And so that's, that's a huge productivity loss. And, and you're right. You know, if, if we can have the right tools in place to be able to solve issues earlier in the escalation path, uh, if not at level one, then at least at level two. And, and again, you know, every support organization looks different. So it's, you know, that sometimes level one and level two are all there is sometimes there's just, you know, for smaller organizations, there's just, there's just the support team and everybody's kind of a one size fits all, but having the right tools in place, having the right data uh, in place and, and particularly having that data correlated and interpreted, that's where, where it's going to kind of be the secret sauce, the, the magic, uh, the magic bullet that comes in and, and gives them the tools and the ability to be able to see uh, the right information and, and get to root cause quickly. And that's, that's really what, that we do at Goliath, you know, we're we're looking at actual end user experience, but from the end user's perspective. And you know, the traditional approach starts with sort of the independent performance of the IT infrastructure and the applications. And then there's 
inference that has to happen there as to what might uh, what the end user's experience might look like. And so you've got essentially this siloed approach where you have each of these teams, they've got their own monitoring tools uh, and the monitoring tools can't see across the silos. So they don't really know how they impact uh, each other. We're starting from, from the end user's perspective and then we're informing outwardly from there. So we're pulling all of this across the entire IT delivery infrastructure. We're pulling all of it into a single view. Uh, and then that makes it a lot easier to diagnose and then see which element is impacting uh, what. And what this does then is provide, you know, the, the, the admin team, the correlated view, the correlated data points to understand what's actually happening that is impacting this end user's experience. You know, the, the end user, they sit back and they, you know, they know there are to some degree silos within the organization, but they just think everything's working together, uh, you know, smoothly to divide, to, to provide this end user experience. What they don't realize is it's actually a miracle that, you know, all of these IT elements, all of the various vendors, you know, 20 plus vendors, technology vendors that are part of the technology stack, all of this is working together in concert and it's it's actually quite miraculous that it works as as often as it does and then you know add to that we're virtualizing uh everything and, and delivering it so it's it's really it's quite impressive what the i you know what you guys your it teams are able to deliver um but it's complex and so it just requires the right tools to be able to to get in there and troubleshoot what's happening and so we're incorporating the breadth of all of those data points and we're bringing it together in a single view. We're collecting all of the key telemetry and we're showing you exactly what's happening and what's impacting things like session performance or issues with logins. And <clears throat> we're doing this by tying all those elements together into a single view. And we'll get into the live demo and, and, and I'll show you a little bit more in a minute, but this gets you out of that siloed approach. And Eric, you were talking about just the silos and passing back and forth from team to team. And, you know, this gives somebody, at least somebody within, within that escalation path, ideally everybody would have uh, access to a tool like this, but at least gives someone in the escalation path a correlated view so that when it does get passed around, you can, you can grab screenshots or, or, or whatever and say, look, these are the elements that are impacting here. You know, networking team, I know that everything looks good in, in your console, but I'm telling you right now that the network latency is high for our end user's perspective, but their connection speed looks good. So it's on, it's on the network team side, it's not on the user side, here you go. Or, you know, you have the ability to go in and say, you know, uh, we're seeing a lot of latency, but, you know, the connection speed is actually pretty low. So it's, it's on the user side. So having all of these tools uh, or all of these data points correlated in a single place makes it much easier to be able to see what's happening with the, you know, what's impacting the end user. The other thing that it does is it means you don't actually have to be a deep expert to identify the true root cause. In fact, uh, this is another pain point that we solve, and we talked about this earlier. It's the lack of expertise, particularly Citrix expertise. There's not enough Citrix experts out there to fill all the roles, all of the open headcount uh, that organizations are looking for. And so they need something that's gonna help the generalists be able to behave like a Citrix expert. Um, and, you know, again, we talked earlier just about the transitional state in, in IT and, and again, driven by the lack of resources. But there's, you know, there's fewer specialists moving to a generalist model. This leaves a lot of gaps, uh, particularly in the Citrix environment because Citrix is really complex. Uh, but because we're doing the data correlation, because we're interpreting the data for IT, they're able to get to root, root cause more quickly. <clears throat> and I'll share a customer story with someone just talked to uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, about um, you know, how they've used that to be able to um, <clears throat> solve issues with a less senior indiv ind individual uh, because the tool itself provides uh, the embedded intelligence and automation uh, and, and interpretation of the data for them to be able to do that. So one thing that I want to uh, to tell you that's new, if you've never heard of Goliath or, or if you've heard of Goliath, um, one of the things that's going to be coming out here shortly, uh, we'll be launching this probably in July, and I'm going to demo it for you as part of our demo, is we are introducing our AI troubleshooting assistant, KIP. 
Uh, and we continue to provide more correlated information. You know, we're looking for ways to simplify troubleshooting, you know, to create less friction and make it easier to get to root cause of user experience issues. <clears throat> and so we're, we're incorporating AI uh, and into this, and it's designed to make your troubleshooting experience a lot easier. So it's going to help with things like resolving uh, common Citrix issues, uh, Citrix user experience issues, uh, understanding the data that's coming in. So you have a tool, you don't necessarily know what the data means, or, or you know, if we're trying to help level one or level two uh, get to root cause or do some of the troubleshooting before it gets escalated, you know, the ability to understand that better, and then the, to navigate uh, and configure the product to your needs as well. So it's not just about troubleshooting, but it's also about making sure that you've you've built out the, the product in a way that makes sense for your organization. So as we jump into the demo, uh, the things we're gonna look at are the most common uh, <coughs> user issues. And this is what we see, but we have a poll I'd like to put up right now real quick as we're jumping into this, uh, just to see, just for you to confirm, uh, which which of these areas do you see most of the time uh, from a Citrix complaint, you know, Citrix user complaint? Is it is it around logon? Is it around uh, logon initiation? Uh, is it taking too long? Maybe the session performance is slow. Uh, maybe you're just having trouble dealing with remote workers. Maybe the, the issues are with remote workers. Uh, so if you just take a minute and fill in that poll real quick just to help uh, validate what what we think uh, we've we've honed in on and that we hear from our customers, but it would be a uh, good validation to hear it from your point as well. Okay. Looks like about half have responded, so I'll leave it just for a few more seconds and then we'll close it out and I'll share the results. Excellent. And three, two, one, pencils down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, huh. Session All performance. Right. Session performance. All right. Normally, we we see the issues, and it's a it's a strong second. Normally, we see the issues around logon duration, but session performance is is a good one, and that's the more ambiguous one, right? There's lots of things that can impact session performance, so we'll get into that uh, as we go into the demo. Uh, Stephanie, am I sharing? <laughs> I don't think I'm sharing anymore, or am I still? Uh, no, I yep. still see the screen. Oh, you still do? Okay, good. All right, so you should be seeing um, my console now, correct? I think so. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. all good, all good. Um, <clears throat> I don't... I don't see the little highlighted box around the screen, so it, it doesn't let me know that I'm sharing. So perfect. All right. So this is this is our console. So let's let's start with logon initiation. So you you have a user that has has submitted a ticket. They can't. Well, um, um, Eric, you were mentioning you know uh, a contractor team in India. They they weren't able to access SAP. So. You know, uh, this is a, a good example of, of what, you know, you could do within this solution. So we have the ability here to look at application availability. So log on initiation. Can you even access the application? And this is a synthetic user log on. It's testing the environment 24-7. So if you, you can imagine, you know, <clears throat> maybe... Uh, some of your organizations, if you don't have something like this, you might have, maybe if you have the people to do it, you might have someone, you know, testing an application right before people are getting ready to log on just to make sure the application is available. Uh, maybe you do that before, you know, major busy times, but it takes someone time to be able to do that and access it. And it also doesn't access it from every single location. So it, it doesn't always capture, you know, whether the application is available in, in one place versus another place. So this is synthetic user uh, logon. So it's testing constantly. Uh, most of our customers do it anywhere between five minutes every five minutes to once an hour. It really just depends on, on the, um, the, um, uh, the importance of the particular application that they're testing. So you can go in and you can look at each application and see 
No, I just have this filtered for today. If I filtered it in the past, you could go back and see historical data as well. But you can go in and see what happened with the application as it was launching. And it's going through synthetically every single stage of the logon process exactly as an end user would go through it. And it's capturing screenshots all along the way. And in the log, it's captioning, capturing every single detail along the way so that if there's an issue with any of these stages, you'll be able to quickly click on that stage and see exactly what happened uh, and look at the logs and also see a screenshot of what the end user would be seeing when the application failed to load. Now, right now, these are all successful launches, so you're not seeing any errors here within the logs, but you're able to see uh, what's happening in detail. And then you get the screenshot of the successful or failed launch as the case might be. You know, we had a, a large healthcare organization and they were uh, using Citrix to deliver their EHR application. And, and they had this running in, in, um, in the background running 24 seven. I think they had their set to run every hour. Um, and the IT team got a notification at four o'clock in the morning that the uh, EHR application was down wasn't working. And now this is an organization, a healthcare organization with 25,000 users. And that includes clinicians, uh, clinical staff, as well as, you know, the corporate staff. So um, you've got 25,000 users now who don't have access to the single most important application that they need uh, throughout their, their day. Um, you even have potential to have, you know, a patient care impacted because this application's down. But because they got notified at four o'clock in the morning, you know, most of the, the clinical offices were closed. Nobody was in at work. The hospitals, they were running 24 seven, but you know, the, overnight time, it's, it's, it's much slower pace. So there weren't as many impacted, you know, practically, you know, logistically impacted in that moment. They were able to go in and leverage this to find out exactly where the issue is. Now, long story short, they had gone through an upgrade. They updated the application. Uh, and when the Citrix team published it, it didn't get published correctly. And so therefore the application failed to load, but they were able to go in quickly. They got notified automatically. Uh, they didn't have to wait until, you know, seven, eight o'clock in the morning when all the doctors uh, and clinical staff are trying to log in and all the tickets are starting to flow in and, and everybody's panicking. They were able to go in and, and fix the issue identify the root cause quickly and fix the issue, get the application published correctly and you know, no harm, no foul. But that was because they had this running in the background. They were able to go in there and see exactly what was happening. But let's say something you know, didn't work correctly. And a lot of times what we'll see is, you know, it, particularly at this stage, something uh, might, might uh, you know, get hung up and take uh, a little bit longer. So if you're uh, the Citrix admin, you might be able to go in and understand reading the logs quickly what it is, but you know, maybe you're not, maybe you want to get this solved a little bit earlier in the stack. So then you can use uh, our AI assistant and type the, the message into the, into the chat window and see what, um, you know, what might be happening. And then it would give you the results to tell you exactly what the issue is. So in this case, uh, there was no match in the window tile. Now there, there is, because this was a, a successful launch, but this would tell you how to go in and troubleshoot that particular issue. So you right? Yes. Yeah, I have another one interesting in terms of, you know, you, you will mention that 4, 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we have situations because we are spread around the world. We have a lot of people in, in Singapore and South Arabia, right? which means right now it's close to night, they're off work, but people down there, they don't work on Fridays, they work on Sunday. So if they have an issue on Sunday, they have to wait more than 24 hours for the HQ team to get it fixed on Monday. Exactly, exactly. And this would, I mean, this helps solve that uh, because that, that, that team is getting notified uh, if there's an issue. So. You know, they can enjoy their weekend, their Saturday and their Sunday at HQ. They can enjoy their weekend if, if everything's running smoothly. Um, but if something goes wrong, they're going to get notified and be able to go in there and solve that so that the, the international teams who are working on Sunday uh, aren't losing productivity and access to their, their important applications. Hey, so Gary. 
Yeah, go ahead, we, Steve. We, we did have a question come in regarding um, if uh, you guys have an epic module for monitoring. Yeah, probably probably that question was spurred because I was talking about EHR. So we actually do have an epic module um, for monitoring. So we've got a, a lot of customers who leverage epic Cerner as well. Um, but we do have an epic module for monitoring. So you can not only monitor the, the applications availability, but uh, we have the ability, we're, we're, we're linked via APIs to system pulse. So we're pulling system pulse data into our console so that you can see system pulse data uh, correlated with, with the Citrix users uh, session. Now, many of you on this call who, you know, if you're in the healthcare space and you're on the Citrix team, which you probably are if you're on this webinar, you're wondering why do you need to have system pulse data? The Epic team manages uh, Epic. Excellent question. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, <clears throat> the, really, the reason is, and this goes back to what, what Eric was saying earlier about you know, the tickets getting bounced from team to team, you know, you having the ability to understand at least at a base level, what's happening with the Epic application and how that impacts your user lets you know quickly if the issue is a Citrix issue or if it's an Epic issue. Because again, the user submits a ticket, Citrix is down, Citrix is slow. Well, it could be that Epic crashed and they were trying to access Epic through Citrix and because they were accessing it through Citrix, they just assume that it's a Citrix issue. It gets routed to your team. Now you're spending all this time troubleshooting, trying to figure out what's going on. But if you had uh, the ability to see quickly, you know, that, that the Epic application crashed, you would know quickly that it's not on your side. It's on the Epic side. You can route that to the Epic team. And then, you know, everything gets taken care of in, in its appropriate course. But without having the ability to see that, you've just now gone down this rabbit hole of troubleshooting something that has nothing to do with you at all. The, the opposite is also true. Uh, a lot of times, <clears throat> a lot of times um, you'll have to work you know, back and forth between the, the Epic team and the Citrix team. Uh, but again, because you, neither of you have visibility into each other's environments, you know, the, the communication takes a little bit longer. There's a lot more back and forth. So being able to see, again, at a base level, uh, some of that Epic information is going to make it a lot easier for you to do your troubleshooting. So it's not designed for the Epic team. You know, this console isn't, you know, our Epic integration is not for the Epic team. It's for, we designed it for the Citrix admins, for the Citrix team to provide just enough information to make your troubleshooting life easier when it comes to user experience issues that could potentially be uh, tied to Epic. So that's, that's really what that's about. So I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, uh, pull that out. And so, yes, I see another question in there, follow-up, does it integrate with System Pulse? Uh, yes, we're, we're pulling our Epic data directly from System, system Pulse. We have their APIs uh, plugged in. Thank you. We also just, you know, since I'm on the topic, I might as well talk about it. Uh, we have a great relationship with Cerner as well, uh, where we're actually able to deploy our agent on the Zenapp server in Cerner's RHO in their data center in Kansas City. So when you're pulling user experience telemetry um, <clears throat> and it's in a hosted, a Cerner hosted environment, uh, you're actually getting data coming from Cerner's data center. So you're getting much more accurate uh, information and, and nobody else can do that. We're the only ones that, that have been granted access to be able to do that. So our agent goes on the Synapse server uh, within the Cerner's data center and that data is then pulled into the console. So the Citrix team uh, has access to be able to see uh, what the end user experience is looking like. All right, so I'll jump into our next scenario. So we talked a little bit about um, uh, log on initiation. So the next stage of that sort of the, the next logical course would be to look at log on duration. So, you know, you have a user, let's say Heather, you know, <clears throat> submitted a ticket and said it was taking her a long time to log in. So you can go to the quick search, type in Heather's name, and you can quickly identify if she didn't give you any more details than that. She just said, I had a hard time logging into Citrix. Um, she didn't give you any more details. You can type in her name, it pulls up her sessions, and you can quickly see right here that you've got uh, a highlighted log on uh, issue. And now we know that the ticket was submitted uh, <clears throat> two days ago. This just got escalated. 
I can quickly identify which session was the issue. So now on your summary screen, you've got all of this data correlated all in a single place, it makes it very easy for you to see uh, everything from you know, what the devices that, that the individual connected with, you know, how they connected in, you know, are they remote, are they on site? Uh, you can see the entire connection path. And oh, by the way, in this particular example, Heather is on a Chrome OS device. So she's using a Chromebook. <clears throat> if you are in an environment where you've got Chrome OS devices in your environment, uh, you're able to see Citrix telemetry because you, you know, you're using director uh, or whatnot to be able to see it. So you're seeing what's happening within the session from a Citrix perspective, but you have no ability to see what the device impact is. Uh, we have that ability. We have a relationship with, with Google where we're actually pulling in the Chrome OS device metrics, health metrics into our console. So we've, they've developed APIs for that. We're the only ones with access to those APIs. So if you've got an environment where Chrome OS devices are, are um, deployed, or even that you know, it's, it's part of you know, on your strategic roadmap, You'll want to consider, you know, <clears throat> having tools to be able to see what's happening with those Chrome OS devices. So yeah, I see in the chat, I'm just kind of looking through as well. Uh, Linux devices, yes, we, we cover Linux as well. And just looking at some of the other questions. So Mac, we, we do not have an agent for Mac. So we're not pulling um, Mac device health, but we can see the, the session data for Mac. All right, so back to the logon uh, duration. So the logon was taking a long time. I can see right here, it's taking 170 second, 177 seconds. <clears throat> we see a breakdown of, uh, a high level breakdown of the, the logon stages here, but I want to drill in. So I'm going to click on the logon tab and I can see the entire logon process broken down into stages. I can see the stages listed out here and I can also see uh, visually with these bars that right now client validation and server validation stage is taking a really long time. Automatically, I've just eliminated everything in authentication, group policy, profile, Interactive. I don't have to look at any of those stages right now. Those are all looking great. And by the way, you can you can drill into those and see what the substages are for authentication and you know any group policy that your organization has. You can see all of that listed here and and segmented out by how long it takes for each of those stages as part of the logon process. You know, in this particular case, everything after server server validation uh, was working just fine. This. This was just an issue where her, her workspace app was, was actually <clears throat> having a difficulty connecting to an available uh, VDA. And so this gets you into a situation where you can quickly see exactly where the issue might be. And then you can get some additional troubleshooting tips as well. Or again, you could leverage our AI assistant to help you go in and figure out uh, what some of the issues are and some of the troubleshooting steps that you can take. But this is because we break down every single stage of the logon process and we show you exactly how long it takes within each stage. So again, you know, when we think about trying to find the root cause of the issue, uh, it's just as important to eliminate steps that you would normally have to take to disqualify issues as it is to point you in the right direction to where the issue is. So we're eliminating that disqualification process and we're pointing you directly to where that issue is. Hey, Gary, um, for the logon uh, predefined threshold, is, is that changeable or is that just baked in? You're talking about as far as what, what constitutes, you know, red, yellow, yes, and green? I believe so. Yes, yeah, you can, you can, you can reset your thresholds to whatever makes sense. And you know, when you, and, and we see this oftentimes too, you know, most organizations have like a like a 3010 SLA. So 30 second logons, 10 second reconnects. But you may have situations too where you've got uh, like Eric was saying, you know, maybe a contracted team in India where uh, where connectivity is going to be uh, a little different there than it would be maybe in HQ. And so you can reset thresholds so that 
um, so that you know maybe a, a, a longer you know 45 second log on is good for a particular area and you don't want that to to peg or alert uh, or send any red flags up <clears throat> because it's you know in that particular location that's actually considered a good log on time so yes uh, that's that's customizable as well and I'll show you too when we uh, get to some of the reporting how you can customize that and make that more applicable. Uh, even, even again, like I said, you know, being able to segment it out by uh, maybe locations or departments or teams. You know, we, we're pulling in uh, Active Directory attributes, so you can even segment uh, this out as well based on on location uh, <clears throat> or departments or teams or country or you know, remote versus on site, depending on how you have things listed in, in Active Directory. Perfect. All right, so um, getting into our third example, because we're running a little bit tight on time, we'll talk about session performance. So let's say uh, Kiri, and this was a, a great example that I didn't intend to set up, but it, it worked out perfect uh, on a session that I was running the other day. So let's say uh, I submitted a ticket and I was having an issue with session performance. So I was getting poor session performance and I submitted a ticket and I said, Citrix is slow today. And I don't give you any more details because I'm not a technical user. I don't have the, uh, the information to understand how to delve into what the issue is to give you, you know, more to go by. I just submit a ticket and I say Citrix is slow. You know, you can log on, you find the, the, the session. Again, you see the session summary right here. We've got all this data correlated uh, in the session. And I can see right off the bat that, <clears throat> that Kiri had an issue with, uh, Ike around trip time that spiked uh, pretty high at 12.55 uh, that, that particular day. And because we've got all of this visualized, uh, you can also see as well threshold lines. You know, I can see exactly, you know, <clears throat> what's happening, zoom in. But I can see, okay, Kiri definitely had an issue. What else was happening? Let me actually reset that. So the lines, what else was happening? All right, well, I see a spike in networking latency as well at the exact same time. So definitely a networking issue, okay? So is it, uh, is it an issue within uh, uh, the data center network or is it an issue with the user network? Well, I can see also, again, because it all visually lines up, that Kiri had a significant drop in connection speed. So let's drill in and see a little bit more what was happening. So you hit the, the ICA HDX tab, and I can see that at that time, that connection speed dropped significantly. And we can see thresholds here. This is where it happened at 1255-ish. I can see that that connection speed dropped. I can also see with the threshold lines that we have here that you know there were several drops within the connection speed. So uh, <clears throat> I think I was mentioning uh, prior to starting the, the session that uh, my particular internet is unstable. So we have you know, great connectivity when it's working, uh, but it's not stable. So you can see right here, my session performance is due primarily to the fact that I have this unstable connection speed drops. If you wanted to drill in a little bit further, you could also see that I was probably, because I were pulling in um, user behavior metrics as well. Uh, <clears throat> I can see right now that, that ThinWire, this is video. I can see that Kiri was running a lot of video. So uh, maybe Kiri was streaming some things in the background. Maybe Kiri was using graphics intensive uh, programs, but you can see that, you know, the connection speed, the bandwidth uh, tied with, you know, the amount of usage and strain that I was putting on the network was all working together to create that poor user experience. But the issue itself at hand was the fact that the connection speed dropped uh, and it dropped to, to three megs. So it went from about 80 down to three. There's the issue right there. Now that's not a Citrix issue, that's a user issue. So now the team has the information to go in and help the user figure out what happened. Uh, do you have a, an, an unstable network? Are you using Wi-Fi? Are you too far from your router? Uh, maybe reset the router, whatever the case might be. But again, it's on the user side and you can see this clearly because it's all clearly lined up and correlated together in a single place. 
Kiri, what's the data retention on those uh, session stats? Yeah, data retention, excellent question. Uh, data retention is unlimited. So the only limitation for data retention is how much space you have on your SQL server. That's, you know, that's the limitation. So we, we see most of our customers um, retain data for around 90 days. That's, that's kind of standard for them. Uh, you, could, you could go less if you don't need that data, but, but effectively the, the data retention is unlimited. Sounds good. And a lot of these are the session stats. Is there anything that you collect via like any app stats, um, you know, launch time or, or anything of that nature? So that's something that's actually uh, going to be on our roadmap. Um, well, it, it is on our roadmap. We're going to get more into application performance. Uh, so right now we're, we're, we're measuring application availability, but you'll see more uh, as we progress into 2023, into the second half, uh, around application performance as well. Right, and just seeing how the VM is performing is is very helpful in in the app performance as well. So at least you got that base done. For sure, for sure. And then you know there was a, another question in here uh, about. Uh, monitoring across multi-cloud environments. So we do actually have, and, and, and I don't have it pulled up today, but we can have another session on this later. If you uh, have some more questions about it, happy to, to take this offline, but we do have uh, <clears throat> a multi-cloud monitor as well, where we're pulling in telemetry, telemetry from, uh, from Azure and from AWS. So we're getting uh, telemetry around Azure VMs, uh, AWS, uh, EC2, uh, AVD is coming soon, so we're we're pulling telemetry around multi-cloud as well. Perfect. So the last thing that I want to show you <clears throat> is around um, reporting, but specifically I want you to uh, see why it matters when we think about technology deploy deployments. <clears throat> so I'm going to jump in here to our reports tab. And we have uh, these unique end user experience reports. We have them for end user experience. We have them for log on duration as well. Now we, we developed these reports initially because we, we really heard that the top complaint from our, our Citrix users, uh, our Citrix admins, where they didn't really have any objective way to, to depict what the actual end user experience was. So that the whole end user experience narrative was controlled by subjective data and surveys. Uh, and that's uh, subjective feedback and surveys. And, and that was really, and still is quite honestly, you know, plaguing a lot of organizations. What, what we developed was a unique scorecard. So we took industry best practices, we worked with CTPs, we worked with Citrix to get <clears throat> these baseline scores so that we can then benchmark the end user experience, and this is all objective, this is straight up just data, no, subjective, no subjectivity introduced into this, and we can baseline that score against industry best practices. So now the Citrix admins, the Citrix teams are able to roll this up to management and say, you know, look, I, I know that you heard some complaints. There's a few people who, you know, maybe some VIP users who had a poor experience, maybe their logon was taking too long, or, uh, you know, they were experiencing high latency, whatever the case might be but it's really not widespread. Organizationally, as a whole, our end user experience score is pretty high. Now, we take that a step further and we think about technology deployments. And this is where it gets really interesting because let's take Chrome, uh, Chromebooks, for example, because we're, we're seeing more and more uh, organizations exploring the possibility of deploying Chrome OS devices. You know, they're, they're more cost-effective. They don't, uh, you know, they're, they're cheaper from an upfront hardware perspective. Um, you know, they're, they're not as prone to, to hacks or malware. So we're seeing that uh, start to, to uptick, which is why we, we partnered with Google and why we're pulling in that device telemetry. But let's, let's pretend, you know, you've got this scenario at your organization where you're piloting this. Somebody is on the hook, by the way, for the success of this pilot. Somebody raised their head, hand and said, you know what, I've got this great idea. Let's pilot this and see what happens. They're on the hook for making sure that's a success. Well, how do we measure that objectively? Because I can tell you, once you introduce, and you know this full well, once you introduce new technology to any end user, doesn't matter who, 
if they don't like it, if it's different, if it's odd, if it if it works differently than they're used to, their subjective feedback is going to be it's terrible, it doesn't work, it's slow, it's broken, you know, whatever the case might be. They're going to blame whatever that new thing is. It may not be broken. There may be nothing wrong with it at all, but you don't have any objective way to measure that. So you use a, a report like this, and before you deploy that new technology, you know, you run this report, you establish the baseline. Okay, this is what's happening with the end user's experience. No subjectivity. This is just what the end user is experiencing based on objective data. You run that report again as you're deploying and after you deploy the new technology to see what the impact has been on that end user experience. What you'll find oftentimes is, you know, the impact is negligible. Maybe it's gotten even better, but the subjective feedback is, you know, it's broken. They're blaming the one thing that they, that they is new, that they don't understand, that they don't like, you know, and I'll tell you personally, you know, <clears throat> I'm a, a Windows user. So if you put anything in front of me that's not a Windows device, I'm going to complain about it. There's nothing wrong with that device. It's me. It's a personal preference. So this takes that out of the equation uh, when, when it comes to new technology implementations. The other thing, too, that you're able to leverage this for, I know we talked a little bit about remote workers. So again, we're, we're pulling in uh, Active Directory attributes. So you can segment out sessions. We were in, in the views section of the dashboard earlier. Um, you can segment out session uh, based on, on uh Active Directory. So if you have your remote users segmented out, it makes it very easy to see them. You could also run reports to see what the remote user end user experience is like as compared to on-site users as well. So you're able to segment it out that way uh, as well. So just some different ways to be able to provide insights. These are, are things that you can set up to automatically run. You can send them to individuals. You can set it one and done. You don't even have to think about running it anymore once you've got them set up. So I just wanted to show that to you as well. <clears throat> All right, before we run into the, to the wrap up, are there any other questions uh, that, you've, that you're seeing come across, Steve? We do have quite a few up there. I just wanted to give you a chance to, because I know we're running short on time to, to finish. Is there, do you want to go through the questions now? Let's just, there's a couple things I want to, I want to touch on real quick, uh, okay. and then we'll just jump through the questions. Uh, first thing I want to touch on is we've got a troubleshooting, a Citrix troubleshooting masterclass series. Uh, some of you may have been on the session yesterday. Uh, it was a great session. And this is a session where we're bringing in uh, Citrix experts. So we had a couple of Citrix CTPs. Uh, on the session yesterday, just talking about different scenarios and how to troubleshoot different scenarios. Uh, yesterday was kind of a, a, a broader reaching session. It was kicking off our series. Uh, and each subsequent session that we have monthly is going to be specifically honed in on a single issue. Uh, our, uh, what are we in June? Our July session is going to be focused on log on duration. So it's going to be a whole session on, on troubleshooting different log on duration issues. So there's a link here in the slides. Uh, for you to be able to access that and register for the series, but I wanted to make sure uh, that I mentioned that. Uh, and then, of course, anybody that might be interested in, in a demo or a trial, uh, happy to help facilitate that as well. So with that, uh, we can go ahead and jump into some of the questions. So we talked a little bit about the, the EPIC module. Um, Jim was asking if you can pull the, pull the trend data um, also with the Epic hosted Citrix environment, you know, and their data center. Um, I'll have to get back with you on that one. That I don't know the answer to that question, but I can certainly follow up with you on that one. Sounds good. We did have something else come through around security concerns around session imperson impersonation. Not sure if that was in regards to some of the session stats you were showing. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to hear a little bit more clarification on what you mean by session imper impersonation. So if you can give me a little yeah. bit more on that, happy to happy to follow up on that. Sure. Um, and then everyone wants to know which LLM model you're using for the AI assistant chatbot. Uh, so we're using Chat GPT Chat GPT four. Okay. Um, and then Jim, another question around, I know we talked a little bit about the, uh, the ITSM tie-ins that you have, such as ServiceNow. Is there something that, you know, that, that really ties those, you know, your product and the ticketing systems in together? 
So yeah, we we have some uh, <clears throat> some integration, some automation where we can run scripts that that tie into uh, ServiceNow and some ITSM tools. Um, we don't have deep uh, a deep breadth of that integration, but that's also on our roadmap items as well to go deeper integration into that. But we do have we do have integration today. Perfect. Um, looks like that was related to the Barrett's question as well. Um, I see one question just, on will the solution work outside the USA. Um, the short answer is yes, but it depends on language packs. So um, <clears throat> if if you're using other language packs, then then that would become uh, more of a challenge. But yes, we have international customers today. Sure. Looks like the Hardeep came came up with a follow up on the and session impersonation, he said monitoring tool session impersonation, which generates alerts on failures can be exploited. Um, maybe this is something that we could take offline yeah, to get more let's, information. Let's I'm still not, out. yeah. Yeah, let's take that offline because we're not we're not impersonating sessions um, and that's not what we're pulling in. We're getting we're getting real time uh, data. So let's, uh, Hardeep, happy to have that that conversation with you offline for sure. Um, can you bring up the the link page again that you had before? I assume we're talking about the troubleshooting masterclass link, but there's also uh, the link for, the, uh, so I'll scroll to that as well. So you can grab this if this is what you're looking for, um, or maybe the link for the, the tech info at goliathtechnologies.com or goliathtechnologies.com if, if you're interested in a POC or a, a trial or a demo. Hey, Kiri, um, if you send those to me or if you want to send me the slide deck afterwards, I can share those links in the follow up email as well. For sure. And I will uh, I will try to grab them and drop them into the chat real quick as, as well. Perfect. All right. Well, that is all that I have for you all today. Um, so, Stephanie, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you and I'll drop the link to the master class in the chat. All right. Thank you. I just want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kiri. And thank you, Steve, for taking time out of your day to be with us and share this information and facilitate the discussion. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. And, and Eric, yes, thank you so much for um, for participating as well and, and the conversations uh, around your experiences. Thanks all. All right. Uh, one last little tidbit. I know some of you may have opted in for a chance to win one of three Amazon gift cards. So we will pull those winners at random as soon as I close out this webinar. So be on the lookout for an email from me to tell you that you won. <laughs> um, and again, we'll send you a bunch of information tomorrow, including the recording link um, via email. And don't hesitate to reach out. If, uh, if you didn't opt in and you have more questions, you can reach out to me um, or contact us at mycgc.org and, and let us know you want some assistance there. And uh, I guess with that, I will let you all get back to the rest of your day. Thanks again and hope to see you at another CUGC webinar or maybe in Excel next week <laughs> in New York. Hope to see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.